So good afternoon and welcome to everyone who's joined us for today's Virtual Connects brought to you by AIA Colorado and the Business of Architecture Knowledge Community. So we have a, um, we have a really important topic today to talk about. It's about firm transitions and ownership. Since we've had a lot of motion in our a &E industry over the last really 13 years, starting with the great recession of 2008 and nine, um, a lot of baby boomers retiring over the past 10 years, and now the pandemic. So we've seen a lot of change in our industry in terms of firm, new firm beginnings, mergers, acquisitions, and we're going to talk about all of that today and what it means to you. So we have assembled a really great panel of experts to share their insights and uh, kind of help us navigate what the opportunities and risks are associated with firm ownership. I'm Nan Anderson, FAIA, and I'll be facilitating the discussion. If any of you have any questions along the way, just use your Q&A box and we'll get to them. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. I'm hoping three. So uh, first of all, Nick Bielitz, who's a certified value analyst with Morrissey Goodell and AE Man Management Solutions. Nick specializes in merger and acquisition advisory for both side, sell side and buy side engagements, as well as valuation financial advisory and strategic business planning projects. His expertise lies in financial analysis, forecasting and reporting, as well as deal structuring and strategic business analysis. Nick has been with our Business of Architecture Committee for the past four years and we really welcome his involvement. Also with us today is Don Thomas, who's president of TBCI. He has hands-on management experience in operations, construction management, design build, and marketing business development. He specializes in strategic planning, firm transition, and business development with sales training for AE firms. And finally, Phil Carty, who has also served on our committee for the past four years, who's a managing partner of Carty Schulte LLC, Attorneys at Law, whose practice emphasizes civil trial work, including defensive architects and engineers, construction litigation, including mechanics liens, and commercial litigation. Phil's the recipient of the AIA Colorado President's Award and is an allied member of the organization. So before I turn it over to Nick, I'd like everyone to take an opportunity to answer our first survey questions so that we can get a better idea of who's on the line and what we're looking at in terms of your all's interest. So if you could just take a minute to do that. And then uh, we'll get back to the answers in a minute. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nick Bielitz to talk to us about the nature of the M&A world and how to, what firm valuation means. Very good, thank you, Nan. And thank you everybody for carving some time out here on a Wednesday. We have a short week coming after the holiday and this is, you know, holidays are great, but me personally, it means I get to do five days work of work and four or sometimes six days worth of work in four. Uh, so I know it's challenging. I know your time is valuable. Uh, we, uh, or that rather, if you have seen me talk before, you know, I tend to lead off these discussions with the comment that Architecture, as good and wonderful as it is as a profession, exists within the business world. And if we have a mission here, it is to make everyone cognizant of what's going on in the wider business world and make them aware that, uh, that the designs that we do and the structures that we put in place very much have to interact in what's going on in the larger economy here. And we have had some pretty heavy disruptions over the last year, year and a half, and it has had an impact on where things are going and what's going on. So we're gonna talk about that. Uh, if, if you remember uh, Chris Berman before Sunday Night Football doing the fastest three minutes in sports covering the den day's NFL action, this is going to be the fastest 10 to 15-ish minutes here in architecture. 
I think that we're going to go over. So please go ahead, submit questions. We're going to hit on a lot of things. I have a handful of slides here that I do want to uh, show everybody because this data is uh, much more easy to process when you can see it in front of you. Uh, as Nan mentioned, we're going to talk about two different things here. One is just going on with the overall M&A, the merger and acquisition trends that are at work in the uh, architecture and engineering industry. And I know some of you architects are probably chafing at being lumped in with the engineers, you know, our cousins across the design and construction aisle there, but that's just the way the, the, the world works. Uh, they have a part to play too in things that uh, get built. Uh, but uh, we do have some changes in the trends here, things that have been at play for some time have accelerated. That'll be the first few minutes, and then we're going to talk about valuations. And at that point, I will not be able to help myself, but I will get up on my soapbox and start talking to everybody about how valuations are done and why you need to pay attention to certain things. So here we go. Uh, real quick here. What we want to get down to first is just a recognition that we are living in a consolidating industry. This is our deal count in the United States going the last 10 years or so. Uh, you can see 2020, things kind of fell off a little bit, but obvious as to why that was, which was the pandemic. But this is the takeaway. Uh, and if I were to take this chart back to the year 2000, so 10 years prior, uh, we were only doing as an industry around 100 deals a year. Why is this important? It is important because you as an architect in an architecture firm exist in a wider ecosystem and you are affected by what's going on uh, in architecture firms from New York to Miami to San Francisco to Texas. Uh, even if your client base is largely or entirely Colorado based, even if what you are doing is high end homes for the ultra wealthy in Aspen or uh, or, or you know, Vail or Telluride or wherever the case may be, you exist within this ecosystem and the ecosystem around you is one of consolidation. It is one of uh, smaller firms not getting gobbled up, not getting gobbled up. It is joining forces with other uh, industry players. And it happens whether or not you're a small firm, small firms defined to 30 or fewer people. It happens if you're a 50, 100 person, 500 person architecture firm. You were looking to do this, and there are reasons why that is, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, but this is the world in which we live in. There are more and more deals getting done, and we expect that to continue. Now, we have to talk about what happened last year before I get to this next piece, which is 2021 is going to be another record year. How much of a record year? We think it's going to be up roughly 20% uh, from what happened uh, previously. Now, in 2020, everything was fine in January and February in terms of the pace of consolidation, in terms of the number of deals that were going on. Uh, but what happened is that in and around March, which we jokingly here at Morrissey Goodale refer to as Tom Hanks Day, that is the day where Tom Hanks went on national TV or international TV and announced that he and his wife were quarantined in Australia with COVID. That made it real to everybody. And within a couple of weeks around that date, you saw state governors starting to order shutdowns. California, Washington State were a little ahead of the game. The rest of the country started to follow suit somewhat begrudgingly, but it was really the end of Q1 last year. What that did to deal making is suppress it for probably 30 to 45, maybe 60 days. And we're in January and February, we were on pace to have a record year in 2020. This is 2020 what I'm talking about. The second quarter was the big chill things ground to a halt. And then by around May or June, really around this time last year, deal makers, architects among them, realized that the world was not in fact ending. The paradigm was just shifting. We as an industry got home and we started working from home and we worked home very well. And generally speaking, unless you were a corporate interiors architect, in which case things just went completely out the window. Uh, generally speaking, the industry worked very well from home. Billable hours went up. Uh, that our clients, generally speaking, kept wanting us to do work. So in the summer of last year, things started to heat up again to such an extent that in the fourth quarter, really in the third, but definitely into the fourth quarter of 2020, we as an industry did more deals uh, in that period of time than we did in the prior year of 2019, which was our record setter in terms of number of transactions. The pace of consolidation has accelerated coming into 2021. There are more people looking to do deals both on the buy and the sell side. That is your critical takeaway here. So if you are an owner of your own firm and you're thinking about transitioning it internally, that is wonderful, that's great. That's how it's been done for 100 or more years. But more and more firm owners are not only looking at an external transition, looking to be part of the M&A dynamic, 
but they were actually founding their firms to go ahead and sell them down the line. And maybe it's eight, nine, 10, 15 years down the line, but that's okay. This has become more and more a part of a business plan. Our most successful clients who are architects are business people who happen to be architects, not architects who happen to be business people. You have to look at it that way. That is how you keep a firm going. That is how you grow it and potentially sell it, whether it's uh, to your internal staff, your up and coming principals, or uh, to an external buyer. So what's going on, right? Your question is, okay, Nick, yeah, we had a pandemic. Uh, things are a little crazy right now. We're all anxious to get back out. Memorial Day was great, except it rained constantly in Colorado, but everybody was happy to party. What now? Uh, why is there so many people out there? From the buyers and the sellers, there are two different perspectives here. First of all, from the buyers, we have a mature industry. What does that mean? It means this industry has been around for a while, we're not the tech industry, right? We are not... We are innovating, but we're not coming up with any new business lines here. We've done it before. The way you expand in a mature industry is to acquire other firms. Gives you access to different markets, different geographies, uh, different staff with uh, their skill sets. And if that is what you're looking to do. That's how you boost your gr uh, growth rates beyond just the natural organic growth that you've got. Uh, two, we do have this recovering economy. I don't know about you all, but my wife and I did our American part to single-handedly restart the economy over Memorial Day with all these massive appliance purchases and getting ready for summer breaks with the kids and everything. Uh, we're doing our part. I hope you all are doing yours. The economy is coming back to life and people can't wait. Business community wants to invest. People want to capitalize on it. We do have that going for us. This is good. We want to operate in an expanding, recovering economy. That is what makes everybody more money. Now, third, is that recapitalization, what do I mean? The traditional capitalization model of this industry is the owners, the principals acquire it, they build it up, they sell some shares or transition over a period of time. What we have right now are more and more larger firms, maybe publicly traded, maybe private equity backed, but larger firms recapitalizing these smaller firms and exiting the ownership positions that way. That's what the slides that I showed previously were showing. More and more interest getting deals done, Larger firms looking to continue to diversify, continue to uh, capture staff uh, abilities in different markets. That's what that word means. Now, on the sell side, there are other things, right? You can't have a marketplace without buyers and sellers. And right now, we've got more buyers and sellers in the marketplace than we've ever seen before. Uh, and that is driven prim primarily, not entirely, but primarily because of these leadership and ownership transition challenges. And depending on where you are in the life cycle of your firm or the life cycle of your career, you know, we have in the last 10 to 11 years gone through a global financial crisis, which kicked a lot of architects in the stomach and then continued to kick them while they were down. And now we've just gone through a global pandemic that nobody alive almost has ever seen before in 100 years, right? And the prospect of now owning a business, well, that can be a little scary to begin with, and it's made more complicated now, uh, particularly by an industry that tends to be a little risk averse, right? Uh, you tend to have good entrepreneurs in this industry, but they also tend to be very careful and starting a business is risky. That leads to uh, challenges with getting people to sign on to be leaders. Something we throw out in our strategic planning seminars uh, is if you're not pre prepared to take out a second mortgage to make your payroll, you probably don't have the risk appetite to be a principal in a small architecture firm, right? Because they do that. You have to take those steps. That's a factor here. Uh, right now, we do have highly motivated sellers, referencing again, the Great Recession. Now we've had a pandemic. If you have a business has gotten through this and your client base is okay, yeah, hey, we're doing pretty well. The market's coming back. Things are opening up. Let's start to sell. That is, that is driving it as well, as well, ties into factor number one. And then we get number three, which is what I'm talking about next. Attractive valuations, right? If there's money flowing and people are doing business that should have positive pressure on valuations. That is not always the case. And I'm next gonna show you some data that speaks uh, uh, specifically to valuation, but it is in the context and it has caveats of what sort of markets that you're in. So there's a couple nuances here to the data. Okay, so let's talk about pricing metrics and where we go. I'm gonna leave this rather boring slide up here because I need to hammer one, home, uh, one point home to everybody. The value of your firm is primarily, meaning almost entirely based Oops, I think you froze up, Nick. Based upon the future cash flows that you expect, am I back? Yeah, you're back. 
Okay, very good. Sorry, I was just warming up into my soapbox speech and the computer must have rejected it. But uh, what I was saying, your, the price of your firm, the valuation, whether it's an internal or external sale, is based primarily on your cash flows. Uh, and those cash flows are driven by your client contacts and they're driven by the, uh, the connections that you have in the industry and your experience in you know, one market or another. That's all very, very good. But when it comes to pricing it, it's about the money that you can actually make. You need to remember that. Uh, not long ago, I got a call from a gentleman uh, back east uh, who he and his business partner, corporate interior architecture firm, you know, very, very good pedigree, had done all these great jobs. And when I asked him what the value of his firm was, he started talking to me about things they had done in the 1970s. Uh, folks, if your value proposition starts with what you did in the 1970s, you have fundamentally missed what drives value in an architecture firm. You need to talk about what you're doing now, the fun things you're doing now, and how you're going to make money on that critically. That's what it is, right? It's not, uh, it's not your pretty pictures. And you have fantastic pretty pictures on your websites and your marketing material. They're beautiful. You should see your stuff and compare the engineering clients we have. Uh, but it doesn't actually make money, right? It is, it is the performance of the architects and the people that you have with you that drives cash flow. That's what makes money here. I'm going to show you now one slide of scary looking data. Uh, this is an accounting moment, EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That's an accounting term. That EBITDA metric is the money. It's the cash flow. It's what people in the C-suites, it's what private equity people, it's what publicly traded analysts on Wall Street look at when they're trying to assess value. How much money are you making a year after you've paid staff and owners and everything else that you need to do? That's the, that's the proxy for cash flow. That's the driver of value. This is data from uh, Morrissey Goodale Preparatory Database. We've been working on it for more than 10 years. Uh, it's very, very current. We're very proud of it. I'm going to focus you on that center column right now, which is the median. This is the middle of the road values. So the way you apply this is if you look at all the deals that we got going back 10 years, whatever your EBITDA is, that earnings number for one year under the median value, you take that and you multiply it by 5.8. So if it's a million dollars, your business is roughly worth $5.8 million. That's what that's saying. We give you the lower quartile and the upper quartile just so you can get an idea of the sensitivity here. The critical takeaways have is you can see that there was a run up in the last couple of years before 2020. Businesses got more valuable. Why? There was work to be done. People were spending money. Uh, very natural in a growing economy and our industry was a beneficiary of that. Uh, in 2020, you can see what happened. Why? Uncertainty in the business climate. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Was it going to be a six month shutdown or were we looking at three years, right? Things fell. Deals went ahead, as I said, in the second and a half of the year, things picked up, but this was a direct impact of uncertainty. Why is uncertainty directly impacting valuations? Is because if your business, as I said, is based upon the future cash flows, what is happening yet to come, and what is yet to come is uncertain, it has a direct deduct in what we're seeing right now. Now, I'm happy to say that the deals that we're a part of right now and the valuations that we're doing right now are showing a reversal of this trend. They're showing things going back up. Uh, so you have to take all that into account uh, uh, as you go through it. Uh, there is a lot here. And if I've done this right, I should have raised as many questions as I answered here. But I wanted to give everybody a flavor for what's going on in the industry. Uh, so I will leave that up here. I'll give you a one minute just to copy down a name, email address. You know, I'm easy to find here. But uh, your key takeaways here while you're doing that is that the M&A, the consolidation trend that we have, is going to continue at least for 2021. I didn't mention it, but when we have the federal government and the administration openly talking about raising taxes this year, uh, possibly retroactively, that came out in the latest budget proposal, uh, that's gonna drive sellers to market because they wanna get it done before next year when conceivably we have a uniform tax code where, where uh, rates have gone up. Uh, that is a factor as well, uh, but uh, consolidation will continue because of the positive long-term nature of the, uh, and outlook for the industry. And valuations now that we've gotten past the shutdown should continue to rise. How much? It depends. <laughs> and therein lies the rub. Okay, Nan, I, th I think I almost made it 15 minutes there, but I will turn it back over to you. That was great, Nick. We didn't even have to turn, your, turn the uh, speed up on you. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, my family mutes me. I try to keep it. <laughs> well. Yeah, a lot of, lot of good information there. And obviously, the, it looks like the industry is going to be coming back this year because 
that's quite the growth curve in, in M&A. So before we go on and I introduce Don to you, um, Brenda, could we pull up the results of our first poll just to see who's on the line today? Wow, interesting. So what stages are your firm in today? It looks like we're equally divided. Just thinking about the possibilities of transitions, changes are coming in the next three years, changes happening now, just completed a transition and no idea. So <laughs> changes happening now, changes happening now. Changes <laughs> happening now. You're gonna get hit by the train if you don't realign. <laughs> Uh, so that's a perfect segue to you, Don, because you, uh, I believe, specialize pretty much in, in internal transitions, and that's what we asked you to, to talk about today, while giving a nod to the person who just is itching to start their own firm from scratch. So two big topics there, but take it away. Thanks. And I echo everything Nick is saying. It's uh, these times are really kind of crazy right now. Um, there's a lot of change. There's been a lot of upheaval. Uh, there's a lot of transition happening. I'm working with a lot of companies that are right in the mix. Um, when you and I talked yesterday, Nan, one of the things I was saying was, let's don't miss conveying the message that internal transition can still happen. Um, M&A is big, it's going to be big, it's going to get bigger, but um, internal, most of my clients really want internal to work. So I want to spend a little bit of time just posing some questions, and I want to pose some questions. I'm not going to answer the questions because I don't have time, but I want you to be thinking about these. If, if you're the seller, and I, I run into this quite a bit, where the seller hasn't really given thought to a lot of the compelling things that have to be dealt with when a transition happens. So what's the seller's mindset? Have you really thought about it? Do you really know what you want? Do you really know what the purpose of your transition is about? Is it converting paper wealth to after-tax cash that you can live on? Is it because you're burned out? Is it that you want to leave a legacy? Is it that, well, I want to hang around. I'd like to hang around and do what I really miss doing from years ago when I got into this thing called a business. Uh, do I want to teach? I have many of my clients say, I just want to get back on the board and draw. I want to create. I want to, I want to satisfy that passion. Uh, big question is, well, are you really ready? Or are you an obstacle? I've had more than one instance where my client got up to the point ready to make the jump and then couldn't because they realized they were dealing with their own mortality. And it was a shocking, just soul wrenching decision about, oh, gosh, I can't really do it. I can, can I really let go if I sell internally and I stay around? Can I stay out of the way? Can I be a value instead of a hindrance? Another big question is, are my, is my company's what I call critical systems, are they well-developed? Do I have the right business development and marketing? Is my project management good? Do I really do good financial management? Are those systems in place? And when I look at the big picture of transition, how long do I have before I can complete it? Most firms that I'm working with, what I have found is they've almost waited too late. Some other questions, and this is now, I know some of you may be considering, I think I'll go start my own business. The time may be right for me to do that. And that's great. There are questions I would pose for you. Uh, questions around my legal structure. How can I pick the right one that's right and best for me when I look at the future life of my company? Am I setting up my corporate documents sufficiently so that they allow me to grow and grow the way I want it to grow? Am I anticipating that I want other owners in the business with me or is it just that I wanna go it alone? How can I find the talent? And these days, that is my number one challenge that I'm finding is the source of talent is tough. It's like it was in 2000. 
it's going to continue to be tough because my generation is going away eventually. And the demographic isn't there in the millennial to support the boomer departure. So we're going to be faced with this challenge. So how do I find the talent? How do I know what kind of culture I want? I need to decide that. Do I have sufficient capital to help me start my business and grow my business? Is that identified? Have I crafted a plan? that really articulates what I'm going to do. Have I written it down and am I committed to it? And as part of that plan, have I set realistic financial targets? If there's one thing I can say in many of my engagements that I find is that we're weak on the financial side. We love the practice. We kind of tend to the business as we can, but it produces some deficiency there. So do I have a plan? Have I set realistic targets? In fact, the big question is, and I'll talk about this a little more, have I designed how I'm going to get out while I'm getting in? If there's one thing I could do the, for the profession and for firms in the profession, it would be to get them to do that when they start as opposed to waiting 20, 30 years in and then start trying to figure it out. Now, the reason why I pose those questions is I want you thinking about that because my focus is gonna be on how you manage the message of transition. And I'm talking here internally, I'm talking about internal transition. These are things that I've kind of compiled over my career in working with a lot of firms about what would really help in terms of conveying to those others that I wanna bring into ownership, what would help really get them in? And to me, the three C's of the message is critical. It's gotta be clear, it's gotta be consistent, and it's gotta be compelling. More so today than ever, because I'm finding that the younger generation isn't quite as hungry for ownership as prior generations have been. Um, part of the challenge is to create clearly what your philosophy of ownership is and to start that very early and to communicate it often. You can never communicate it too much. And as I said a minute ago, design a clear exit plan. How are you going to get out and do it when you start your business if you're considering a startup or if you're considering buying the company, a, a company out? Explain how it's going to work. I find that it's extremely critical to really differentiate these three things, what it means to manage, what it means to lead, and what it means to own. Most often what I found is that those three things are not clearly understood in terms of how they are different. And it really gums up the mechanism because I end up with owners who don't lead or leaders who don't manage or managers who don't own or other combinations of that. And it's kind of, it makes it kind of difficult. I like it when very clear expectations are set about what it takes to be an owner. If I'm a young person and I'm wanting to come into ownership, I want to know what do I get, but what do I also have in terms of obligations? And I need that to be very clear. As I'm growing the business or as I'm in the business, I really want to be sure that I have excellent alignment around why my business exists and what its purpose is. Because if I can get a good balance of that, and I'm calling it the most beneficial balance, I need to have that balance between the practice the doing the architecture and the business, the business of architecture. One thing I'm seeing a lot these days, and I'm using Harrison assessments a lot, is to really understand human behaviors associated with a transition because it gets into wants and desires and emotions. It really begs for the, you need to know why. I need the, I, the, the message around the transition really needs to be backed up with financials because if the financials aren't there 
it's kind of tough to help the ones who are wanting to buy in really what I call see it. They just are otherwise offered a blind opportunity to come in. And I want more than that. I want them to be able to see what it means financially, as well as understanding the practice. So operating open book as a behavior is essential. And I would encourage as part of a message and all of this, I, I, I kind of roll into a message. Part of it is behaviors. Part of it is things that you do. Part of it is communication. But all of this will help you through that process of transition and preparing for transition. You might want to consider a tiered ownership approach as you look at transition. Again, remember, I'm talking about internal. Make it easier for new owners to come in. Bring them in at different levels. It's a, it's, it eases the financial pain a little bit, and it can help. If it's an external situation, now I'm switching from internal transition to an external, how you, how you communicate, how you message the transition, by all means, keep it quiet. And by keep it quiet, I mean, I don't want the marketplace to know that I am trying to sell my firm until I have done all of my preparation and due diligence because I don't want my competition being able to use that against me. I wanna explain it, what's happening to my clients, and I'm talking both internal and external inside my company as well as in the marketplace. I want them to know why it's happening and what the benefits are. I wanna describe how I'm going to preserve what I'm going to call my secret sauce, what it is that made me special, different, more valuable, and how my transition is going to benefit that. I want to really be able to convey my plan for avoiding any service disruption or impacts on quality. I want to convey who's staying and who's leaving. And to my clients, how are those key points of contact going to be handled going forward. I don't want to leave it to something that's ambiguous or that becomes a shock to the client. I really want to provide assurances regarding future performance, that everything's going to be great, better, and it's going to really be beneficial. So I, what I want to do is I want to sell the transition plan, including how, as I merge or am I am acquired, how that integration of the merged entity happens. Um, that's kind of it. Like I said, fast moving. Um, I'm going to provide these slides to, to Nan. My contact is information is available here. Um, I work all over the U.S. and Canada. I've been doing this for many, many years and uh, continue to, will continue to do that for many more, uh, assuming, you uh, I'm still healthy and we get to travel again, which I'm already doing. So thanks, Nan. Hope you have some, I hope I raised some questions. Thank you, Don. I'm sitting here taking off all sorts of questions in my, in my head. So absolutely. And I'm sure we'll get some from the audience as well. Um, I do see kind of a theme emerging here that we need to be not just architects, but business people, whether we're merging, acquiring, or launching our own firm. So um, that's certainly a word to the wise for all of us. And before we give it over to Phil, who's going to tell us about the risk side of all these transitional opportunities, I just want to throw it back to Brenda for a second to pull up our second survey, if you could, please, Brenda. And if you all could, all of the audience at home watching back in your office, if you could answer this, what might be in your next career? No, what might, what, might, what might be next in your career? Okay, so if you all could answer that while Phil tells us about the speed bumps and potholes in the road ahead. Phil. Thank you, Nan. Um, so uh, let me, uh, First of all, uh, just a quick introduction. I uh, defend cases uh, filed against architects and engineers. I help architects and engineers with contracts, uh, with uh, 
uh, some business side work such as buy sell agreements, etc. Um, and I would echo everything that Nick and Don said, and that is that it is really important to pay attention to the business side. The issues that I see uh, develop in litigation, uh, the issues I see develop internally within a firm uh, are largely, uh, or often anyway, arising out of the fact that people are paying more attention to being architects and less attention to being businessmen. So I want to talk a little bit about what I think uh, is most important for uh, any firm, frankly, but certainly for new firms, uh, because we see a lot of those and a lot of those get into some sort of trouble. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, focusing on how a new firm uh, manages its risk, reduces its potential liabilities, uh, there are uh, some key elements to doing so. Uh, the first is client selection. You talk to any insurance company who sells professional liability insurance and any lawyer who represents architects and engineers on a regular basis, uh, you will find out that client selection is a huge piece of risking, excuse me, managing your risk. Uh, sometimes the best business decision is turning work away. Uh, so uh, if, if we delve into what does that really mean, that means be careful about who you decide to work for. Uh, if you have clients who are novices, clients who are uh, want to chisel you for every dollar in your fee, uh, clients who don't want to be fair in a contract negotiation, be careful. Um, and I understand it's very difficult in starting a new firm uh, to walk away from work. Uh, it's counterintuitive. Uh, I understand. Uh, but sometimes it's the best decision. Um, when you're working on a contract for a new client, uh, I always liken that to the honeymoon portion of a relationship. And if you're not getting treated fairly in the honeymoon, uh, it's, it's not going to get better. Uh, as uh, the project uh, develops and the relationship evolves. Um, and again, uh, let me emphasize, and this is really just picking up where uh, Nick and uh, Don uh, uh, left off. You're running a business not a charity. So first and foremost, don't work without a contract, a written contract. Um, it is so often uh, that I hear uh, a client say, well, I never really did get a contract signed. Um, or I never even had a contract. Uh, we just talked about it, but we didn't really do anything in terms of memorializing what our agreement was. So number one, get a contract signed. Uh, if you make a proposal, your proposal should say, we will start work as soon as this contract is returned signed. Um, it is really important to have that written contract. Now, um, does a contract uh, or is a contract enforceable if it is not signed? Sometimes, in fact, often. If the parties have proceeded with the work, done all the work, you've uh, received all the payments that the written contract calls for, even if it's not signed, that contract might be enforceable or it probably is. The problems that uh, you'll find is that the specific terms that you want to rely on the things that limit your liability, uh, that manage your risk, those kinds of terms won't be enforced unless the document is signed. In other words, unless there's evidence that the client actually saw the terms that you want to rely on and agree to it. So contracts are important. Many architects try to use a letter agreement that they've drafted themselves. I don't recommend that. Uh, if nothing else, 
you should just uh, default to using an AIA form contract. Many architects are afraid of using it because it is so long. It's intimidating to the client. Uh, why do we need all of that language, uh, all that verbiage? Uh, I don't even understand it myself. Uh, some architects would, would think. Um, and so they just stay away from that and they try to write something simple that they understand uh, or they think they understand and have a client sign it and they're good. Uh, I would suggest you not do that. Uh, if you're going to use a custom made contract, have somebody who knows the construction business uh, and the legal world, look it over. Uh, you may have terms that are unenforceable. You may have sentences that don't make any sense. Uh, you may have, uh, you may be missing terms uh, that you need. Um, the reason I suggest the AIA forms is because they really cover the waterfront pretty well. Uh, what do I mean by that? They have a clear identification of the parties to your agreement. So often there's confusion there. Uh, is, the, is your client the individual you're speaking with on a daily basis? Uh, or is it the entity that they have formed to own this piece of property? Or is it uh, an, uh, a development company that uh, is uh, been in business for a long time and they have not yet formed the LLC or whatever it may be, the single purpose entity that they're gonna have own the property. It's important that the client be clearly identified in your contract and the AIA form provides for that. It also provides for identity of the architect. It's not gonna be an individual typically, it's gonna be a PC and LLC. Um, and it's, it's, it's important that that be identified. The AIA document uh, is obviously got uh, uh, terms where you can describe the scope of work. It's critical that your scope of work be clearly defined. And that means not only what you're going to do, but what you're not going to do. Uh, so many clients want to put in a term that says, you will provide all of the work that is normally provided for a project like this, all of the services, design services that are inherent in this project or this kind of project. They actually uh, are parroting a con construction contract, which will typically say, you're gonna provide all the materials and labor, et cetera, et cetera, and everything appurtenant to uh, this type of project to deliver a complete project. And you'll find that quite often as a matter of fact, that is that owners, or clients and their attorneys will provide you with a contract that they have borrowed from a contractor. Uh, and it will have all kinds of terms that are really not applicable to your work. Uh, it will have warranties, guarantees, and things that are uh, also not applicable and not insurable. So, uh, and they will talk about things that, uh, that are obligations that you don't have, such as obligations towards site safety, towards means and methods. Um, so it's, it's really important that you not use a contract that is either uh, a, a borrowed contractor's contract or something that really uh, uh, is a modified contractor's contract, but talks about professional services. The AIA contract is hugely important because it has uh, terms regarding what the owner will have to do, what his obligations are. Now, usually that just means payment. Uh, however, for an architect, it also means uh, that they have to provide site information. What is the site information? Survey and geotechnical. It's hugely important that those things be identified as an owner obligation, uh, that you have the right to rely on the things that he's going to provide. Hey, Phil, we have yes. just about a, another minute here. Could you well, also, because I, th I found this really helpful, could you also cover uh, a little bit about if someone is merging with another firm so firm X is, mer or is being bought out by firm Y. 
What does firm X need to do to protect themselves once they have been absorbed by firm Y? Uh, the uh, most important thing for the acquiring firm uh, to uh, uh, manage is the liability of the firm that is being acquired. How are those liabilities going to be handled? Um, is there going to be insurance for them? Are they going to be separated and left or perhaps left in the old acquired firm, whether that's a corporation and PC, whatever? Um, the key and, and what happens most of the time is that a firm, a small firm acquiring another firm will do an asset only acquisition. But that means the liabilities stay with the old firm. And how are those to be handled? It used to be, or there uh, is the option of tail insurance. Uh, there are a number of things that can be uh, done and should be done to uh, deal with the liabilities that the old firm has and to protect the new firm from the liabilities that the old firm may have. If the projects that the old, that the acquired firm performed uh, have claims unless you have made provision for separating yourself, that is the new firm, from those liabilities, uh, then you will be acquiring those liabilities as well as the assets of the firm. And the assets uh, obviously are anything from uh, the goodwill to the talent to the uh, equipment. Uh, but you need to make uh, provision for making sure that the new firm isn't acquiring all of the old liabilities uh, unless you have a means of managing and handling those, whether it's through insurance, whether it's through money in the bank, um, whether, uh, you know, there are other mechanisms. Does that answer your question then? Yeah. yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I want to leave time for some Q&A, uh, but before we, so thanks so much, Phil. That was terrific. I have another question for you in a minute here, but uh, Brenda, could you please bring up the survey results? Oh, wow. So here we have a clear, so the uh, we have 50% are thinking about mergers or acquiring to grow their, or, or an acquisition to grow their firm. Um, some advance within their current firm, launch a new firm, sell their firm. Okay, so uh, Nick, I'm going to put you on the spot here. If someone is contemplating a merger or, or an acquisition, what, what's step one? How do you even start that conversation? Sure, well, you, you have to idea, and Don talked a little bit about this. It's kind of like you plan for it before you get into it, right? Uh, that's, that's ideal. The most challenging situations we have are when it's kind of a forced issue. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a health matter with one of the partners or there's something has come up that, that forces a deal here. Uh, if you're looking, however, long term, you need to still very much take care of the next, you know, your staff, your team, your next set of owners. Depends on how big your firm is. Uh, and that's simply because, because this is a people business, right? And because it is the minds and the brains of the employees that make this work, you've got to make sure that those people are going to be in a good place with your decision and as you go forward. So you cannot neglect the development through client management or project management of the staff around you. That, that's the important thing. Essentially, you're, if your firm is the golden goose, uh, you, you want to make sure it's well fed and well taken care of before you start the process. And that is for both from an internal perspective with the staff, and then it's just from the external perspective that you're able to, to market and execute for your clients. So do you even share with your staff, hey, we're, we're considering this, we're, you know, firm Y has approached us, this is something new to us, but we're interested. No, we don't, we don't recommend that. So if you're a, you know, two, three, four person team and you've got a staff of X number of people around you, don't rock their world with that sort of news. You, yeah. I mean, you'll lose even your best staff. And the reason is very simple <clears throat> is that if, if most people in the daily course of their lives, you know, apart from any family 
disaster, or, you know, major life issues getting in the way, you, you spend pretty much half your time thinking, worried about your family, and the other half of time is thinking and worried about your career or your job, right? If you tell people that you're thinking of selling the company, you've just obliterated half of what they're worried about every day, right? You, you've blown it up. There's no reason to talk about a deal until you actually are, are contemplating a deal and you have a written offer that you're discussing. Oh, totally Otherwise, agree. Just, That's why I say keep it quiet. Yeah. You know, yes. As best as you can. I had a person tell me once, that's one, that's two, that's 111. <laughs> Exponential <Keep it> growth. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Don, can we, can we talk a little bit more about that, about managing the message? Because obviously, eventually, you've got information that's going to, to get out. Um, how, do you, how do you manage it in a positive way? especially if it might mean that one or another partner is going to ultimately exit. If, if I know, if I'm the owner or owners in the firm and I know with a fairly reasonable degree of certainty that I'm not gonna make it through internal transition, I'm going to be very open at a point and I'm going to, I'll, I'll, do, I'll dual track. I will try to make internal work while I'm also doing my best to find the proper partner, strategic buyer, whatever it may be to acquire me at a point when I know that that's got to be the path. But by doing that, what I'm doing is I am getting the buy-in of my key people in the company who understand what's going on and they're not shocked the day that we have to go outside if i've educated them well if i've been open and honest with them and we've operated open book and they understand the business and they appreciate the practice when i get to an eventual outside sale i don't usually lose people because they know they gave it their best and they understand that that's business mm -hmm. as opposed to flipping a switch one day and suddenly they find out that someone just bought them. I, I, I love to hunt for talent in the wake of an acquired company. Hmm. It's where you find some of the best talent because they're not happy. Mm -hmm. They were shocked and surprised and disappointed because they thought maybe one day they were going to get to be one of the owners. So, it's so a, that's a, that's a really interesting point because uh, you talk about internal, growing, growing the next generation internally. Is, is that something that's incumbent upon the principal? Or is it also, in some situations, incumbent upon the employee to say, Both. Both. okay, well, Both. talk about I, I interview that. a lot of young people who are wanting ownership. And the ones that I find that really shine are the ones who are the kids of parents who own their own business. Hmm. And the others, quite often, you don't have a sufficient number of them in a company to buy the, buy the sellers out. So you've got to grow others. And that's where I say operate open book, have a culture of openness, share things, make sure they understand this is a business and this is a practice and these things need to have some sort of balance. If they get out of balance, you'll have a commodity firm that is going to sell for cheap because it's all about the money, or you're going to have a firm that's all about the practice that doesn't really know how to make money, and they're just at the mercy of good or bad luck as to whether they stay in business. So the awareness of the balance of practice and business is crucial. Mm -hmm. And it's the principle, it's the principles or the partner's obligation to themselves and to their people to make sure that that education is happening. Start it early and make it continuous. It should never stop. And then you'll end up with great array of buyers who through different mechanisms can come into ownership and the company can healthily transition internally. Bill, I'm going to put you on the spot. Have, have you ever run across or what would be your example of the worst agreement that you've seen in terms of younger owners coming into an ownership agreement 
where they didn't get what they thought they were getting, or likewise a, a merger or an acquis acquisition? That's a question to me? Yeah. Have you ever uh, seen anything like that? Uh, well, it, the worst agreement is no agreement. Um, and and let, let me just echo what Don just said. It, it, the successful firms, that is the ones that are born and bred locally and that continue to thrive after 50 or 60 years are the firms that do exactly what Don talked about. That is, uh, when they bring new people in, uh, they incorporate them, uh, indoctrinate them into both sides of the business, the design side, the business side, they let them know that they're, uh, they need to be involved in all aspects of the business um, because that's the only way it's going to continue to thrive and you're gonna create new owners, if you will, buyers for your shares um, who uh, can develop business and service that business. Um, but again, the worst agreement is no agreement. Um, and in terms of war stories about bad agreements, uh, I, I don't have war stories about bad agreements so much as um, really they just haven't given it any thought and they don't have an agreement as to, uh, or, or even an expectation because as, uh, they, they haven't done what Don was describing. They haven't brought the new, the young people along and mentored them in the different aspects of the business uh, that are critical to making it long-term and successful. Mm -hmm. Dan, if I could add something, I would say that more times than I should find, I find that the buyers who buy in and who are holding an agreement don't know what they've signed. Mm -hmm. They don't That's even right. know and feel, uh, Nick will, Nick will, I think, second yeah, I see Nick, uh, Nick is itching to they, they don't even They don't even know how they valued it. When you ask them, how do you value your shares? They go, well, gee, I, some formula out there somewhere, but we really don't know what it means. Right, Nick? Formulas are fine. Just have to understand what they are and how they but, work. Yeah, exactly. So, so Nick, going to your formula of the EBITDA times uh, five point whatever, is, is there also kind of a bit of, a, of an art to it? So for instance, if you're looking at a firm that's just gotten a five-year contract with a big governmental agency, is that going to weigh in or is it purely the formula of EBITDA? So it's never purely a formula, but it's the earnings number and the sustainability of it. Uh, and the expected sustainability of it, which drives pricing. So a long-term contract, you know, federal contracts are good for that, run three, four, five years. Or if you have a recurring corporate contract, we've got an architecture client that does uh, space planning for uh, laboratory and healthcare clients, uh, you, know, so, you know, big, you know, stuff like that, that, that is going in nature and is repetitive and is sustainable. Uh, if you were looking in, for instance, a firm that, you know, I mentioned high-end mountain homes, you know, it's repeatable, sure, but you don't have a long-term contract there. Uh, or if you're doing something that's a little more nuanced, like, uh, 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 you know, houses of worship, uh, you know, that, that market can really go up and down. That'll give buyers pause. Uh, or, and even, you know, internal buyers as well as external buyers, you know, those are very familiar with the business. So it's, uh, you, you want to look at any multiple as a guideline, uh, but specifics always come into play and it's specific buyers, internal and external will have very different conclusions about how they look at the business. Um, it, it is actually startling to us. Brenda, am I missing any questions from the audience? I'm looking at my chat and not, not seeing them. I think everybody's a little shy today. Okay. Okay. Do we have any, do we have any questions? Otherwise I'm just going to keep rolling here. So the um, uh, Nick, again, back to you, the, the idea of a transition when there's been an acquisition, how, what's, the, what's the relative lifespan of the smaller firm? So it's typically absorbed by a larger firm. Do, does the cult of personality completely go away? Do, are there agreements that certain key players have to stay around? How, do, how does that work? Yeah, so this, the selling principles will have to sign uh, some degree of long-term employment agreements. 
but that typically makes the general staff feel better, right? It's the situations where the principals are, if they're going to leave sooner rather than later, that, that makes the personal connection go away quicker. Uh, as far as the business actually being absorbed, you know, your diversity will add to our own, you know, your, your, you know, you know that sort of thing. Uh, it is very dependent on the deal itself. If you have a well-entrenched player in the Rocky Mountain region and your buyer is Texas, California, East Coast based, what have you, uh, they may not want to change anything. Uh, they just might want to leave it alone, play on the trade name. If you sell to Stantec, and a lot of people don't know this, but Stantec gets more than 50% of its revenue every year from architecture. Uh, if you sell to Stantec, you are joining the Stantec program sooner rather than later. And you will have Stantec business cards and your website will be acquired by Stantec and in a way it goes. Not a bad thing, it's just a different. That's, that's how they approach it. Uh, so, so it depends there, but those conversations happen early. Uh, when, when you're talking the deal. Once you've agreed on the rough framework, you start talking about how it's going to go. Uh, but selling principles, yeah, you're in for several years. <laughs> Big, some of the biggest challenges we have, Nick, I want to sell my firm by December 31 and I want to be out by January 1st. Oh, yeah, so great question. And, and Don, you, you talked a little bit to this in your intro. Um, obviously, a firm that's just starting wants to think about its exit plan, but when is it too late? If you're is three years enough is 10 years enough what it well, what's my experience is that if you're looking at a transition window internal transition window for the seller to be out and bought out and and feeling safe like okay i did it that's a 10-year window now there's lots of variations on that 10-year window but that that's pretty much a good rule of thumb because there's a lot that has to happen in that window. Now, my most extreme case of it was when two 84 year olds decided that it's time to sell and they sold to some 70 somethings. Mm -hmm. That's not getting the job done. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's delaying the inevitable. So the challenge is that you need to generation jump, yeah. especially if it's a boomer. The boomer needs to jump to a young Gen Xer or an older millennial because there needs to be a lot of life in that so that the debt can be paid, the firm can be transitioned, all the things that need to happen can happen. And that's the okay. worst thing to try because they have no money. So we've got a couple of questions here I want to get to quickly. Uh, this is a great one. And Don, I'll ask you to respond to this. Any advice for younger partners to best deal with older partners on their way out? <laughs> yes, treat them with great respect and honor. But when the deal is being firmed up about what's going to happen, make sure that they understand that their time has passed, but treat mm -hmm. them with respect. And here's what I mean. Let's say it's a CEO or a managing principal who now hands it over to his, his or her successor. He needs or she needs to move. They need to move out of the space they're in and not try to maintain the past because that becomes a frustration to the successor. So it takes both parties to respect what needs to happen, but to the it's to both parties, the buyer and the seller's benefit for that to happen because then the incoming individual or individuals can start to perform in the role that they are intended to perform in. Yeah. The senior partner needs to step aside yeah. gracefully. Yes. yes. Make and, it phys and physically, you know. The, yeah. the, 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 yes. And actually the pandemic has been great for that because we've got clients who their senior partners just stopped showing up at the office yeah. uh, entirely. It never came back. Yeah. Uh, and it, you know, that, that actually paved the way nicely for a transition. Yeah. So uh, another question here, and I hope I'm interpreting this correctly. Uh, Nick, do you see pr any change in kind of the climate for, uh, for young people, uh, particularly minority and African-American, Hispanic in partnership type roles. I, oh, I oh yes, yeah. The question correctly, but. 
What are you seeing? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so your larger firms, I beat up on Stantec a little earlier, but uh, larger firms like that, they they have their 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 DEI, their diversity, equity, and inclusion programs well in place, uh, and they, they do have you know established corporate policies for that. And your smaller you know more niche architecture firms, there's just so much going on as a business owner. They're they're likely not as robust. Maybe not. You know, it's it's very very firm specific. But here's the huge huge advantage. I mean, this is the opportunity here that we have coming up with uh, uh, for minorities and, and women as partners in the architecture industry is it, we've, we've, dan- we've touched on this a little bit, but the baby boomers are retiring. And one of the things that we look at at Morris Goodo all the time is that the baby boomers as a cohort across all industries, across the country, are like 70-ish million people. The Gen Xers, me, you know, they're like 45 million-ish people. And then the millennials are roughly 90 million. Uh, you can't transfer what the boomers have going, the millions they are, to the Xers. There's not enough, right? And there's more millennials coming up. So we're in this lurch, and it's common to a lot of industries, but particularly in the design and construction world, particularly in the design, uh, the design side. The, uh, it, you know, simply put, this industry needs the young bodies. We need the young people, right, uh, to, to come into this. And be, by virtue of that need, there are opportunities of all sorts uh, for, for those young professionals coming up. Uh, you get those larger firms who have those, you know, the acceleration policies in place for DE&I. It, it's a great place to be. Uh, smaller firms often have a greater growth curve uh, to them, just because you can you can build on that. Uh, but there there are uh, there are opportunities, and there will be more opportunities as the, as the economy really starts to come back online. Couldn't agree more. I've been in this profession since 1968, and if oh, if I could be young now, coming into this profession, both engineering and architecture, what opportunity? <laughs> because the demand is there, the challenge is there, but the demand is there. So you can, you can paint your own future. Really exciting times and, and wonderful discussion. I want mean, to thank all of our panelists, Phil, Don, and, and Nick, really provocative information. Hopefully we gave uh, some, some, we got some questions answered of, of the audience. And I want to ta- thank all of you for taking time, carving time out of your busy days to join us. And we look forward to seeing you in our next virtual connects. So, thank Nan, you all. hey Nan, I would say that if anyone out there, and I'll say this on behalf of Nick and Phil, if you you have our contact information, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us because if you didn't want to ask a question in this forum, we're still around. So, it's been a pleasure. Great, thank you all. Great, thank great you. afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye now. Bye-bye.